So a garden is so much more about just growing certain crops. I love beetroot in case you didn't know. Now, when we're focusing our strategy on becoming more self-sufficient, usually some key crops like potatoes and onions and carrots uh, are what given a lot of attention. But in this video, I wanna feature seven crops that I think are highly underrated that contribute massively towards becoming more self-sufficient. I hope you enjoy. But first, I wanna let you know about a really fun competition we're doing to celebrate the launch of HughesGarden.com and it's open to both the UK and the US. There's gonna be one winner each. You've gotta select a series of products up to the value of $1,000 or £1,000. So your favorite Vigo garden bed, favorite cold frame mini greenhouse, uh, favorite tool garden supply and book. So there's a link down below in the description and any further information, but I hope you enjoy and I'll announce a winner two weeks from now. Let's head over to our other site for the rest of this video. Let's start off with the first underrated crop. And I think pak choy takes that place. This is some pak choy that we've got growing here. It's been very productive this year and it grows so quickly. It's almost on the kind of same kind of growth rates as radish. You kind of blink and then suddenly it's ready. The other winning part about this is the actual texture that it gives, the crunch that it gives when you eat it raw, or if you lightly cook it in a stir fry, blast it on really hot. That is such an underrated texture because if you're having other leafy greens, for example, say I've got some so it's got some chard here or some lettuce or some spinach they all kind of fall under the same texture and if you're going to be trying to grow as much as possible from your garden you want to make sure that you have some enjoyable experiences and that's one thing that pak choy can certainly offer around this time of year we're not usually associating it with certain sowings but a really good thing to sow right now is pak choy but undercover, be it in a polytunnel or in the polycrub. Uh, you could also double insulate it using a cold frame, for example, using a cold frame within a polytunnel and grow pak choy because I found that it overwinters really well in an undercover growing space. And it's a beautiful green and harvest to enjoy during those dark winter days. Another underrated crop, which has a bit of a love slash hate relationship with various gardens, but for me, I love it. It's Jerusalem artichokes, also known as sunchokes. And right now they're flowering and they look absolutely stunning, especially when the sun comes out, they just absolutely glow. This is the kind of crop that you just plant and forget. It's a tuber and this, these all here have come from our main garden and we've been growing them using the exact same initial stock of tubers for around 15 years. So the great thing about this crop is you don't actually have to worry about storage. So you let it grow all year, it will outcompete any of the weeds and then from kind of December through to March, you just dig up, yes, dig up, I said the dig word, dig up and enjoy the roots as and when you want them. And simply to replant, you just put a nice big dollop of compost or some well broken down manure, put a tuber spaced every 30 centimeters or a foot, just under a foot deep, and it'll come back every single year. Next underrated crop is beetroot or beet. Uh, this is such a stunning vegetable, but I feel it's really underappreciated. And I think it's actually down to the, the way that people cook it. And recently my colleague Sam, who's written the book, The Nature of Food, you might have seen, he showed me the best way to cook beetroot and I, I'm never gonna look back. What it consists of is turning your fan oven to around 180 degrees Celsius, just giving these a bit of a wash, but chucking them in take off the root and the, and the leaves, that's it. Let it cook for about an hour to an hour and a half and then let it cool for about 20 minutes. And then all you do is you peel off the skin and what you've got is such a beautiful, sweet roasted root to enjoy. You can have it hot, you can have it cold. And as well, the other thing about beetroot is there's golden beetroot. So if you're not so keen on the earthy flavor of this crop, golden beetroot will completely change your life because it's a, it's a beetroot 
but it has so much more sweetness and less of that earthiness. And it can be cooked in the exact same way. The other thing about beetroot, which is also overlooked, is it's, I think, one of the easiest vegetables you can grow. And I've also found over time that the performance, this here is just some, some golden beetroot. You can see the color, absolutely stunning. We found that whether it's direct sown or multi-sown in modules and then transplanted, both work really well. So choose your favorite way to grow beetroot, grow a lot of it. It also stores quite well in the ground. So if you've got loads left and they've started dying back in winter, you could cover it with a load of leaves or straw and still harvest it for a couple of months. So you don't have to worry too much about lifting them up and storing them. Next up is the humble pumpkin. We've got a bit of a nice pumpkin patch here with around 40 to 50 fruits and they're looking really, really nice. But there's actually a reason why this is highly underrated. And it's because you can use it as a dual purpose. Whether you want to use it in sweet recipes or savory recipes, a pumpkin is suitable for it. You know, pumpkin soup, pumpkin pie, very savory, but also very sweet. Absolutely quintessential autumn foods. So the other thing that I love about pumpkin as well is if you've got a patch of land like we had here, we just needed to fill it with something, pumpkins is perfect for that because they'll just spread over, take over. They need some space to stretch their arms. And that's what they've done here and they've yielded really nice. So if you do have a patch of land that just needs something growing on them, absolutely turn to pumpkins. You don't even need much compost for them. You don't need to put compost over the whole area. You just put it in the individual transport holes for the fruit. A final thing that I want to say as well about pumpkins is yes, they do store well, but one of the best things about them as well is the seeds inside. Pumpkin seeds are absolutely delicious snack. If you give them a wash, dry them, and then you roast them at around 180 degrees for 12 to 15 minutes with a load of spices and salt mixed up, it's such a beautiful snack for you to enjoy. And I really believe that self-sufficiency is about finding as many special things that you can also enjoy from the land. And pumpkin seeds is definitely a wonderful thing to be able to eat. Another element of self-sufficiency that I think is sometimes overlooked is instead of looking at the actual crop, look at the varieties within that crop. I can't show you right now because it's the wrong time of year, but I want to put a recommendation towards sugar snap and monge two peas. The reason why these I think are better for self-sufficiency than garden peas is you're not going to spend hours podding hundreds of pods. Instead, you can blanch and freeze them really quickly at scale so you can store and enjoy peas which taste amazing but enjoy them throughout autumn and winter. And the details on how to best store potted peas, as in the pea pods, not just the individual garden peas, will be down in the video description. I bet you weren't expecting this next one, but I'm actually gonna promote mint as an underrated crop for self-sufficiency. And it comes under that umbrella of trying to find as much enjoyment and satisfaction from your garden and not settling for less. The thing that I love so much about mint is of course its flavor. And one of the things that isn't spoken much about in self-sufficiency is just drinks, hot drinks. And being able to come to the garden and grab a massive handful of mint and then create a tea, a fresh mint tea, is so enjoyable. I can never get bored of it. And that's something that I think we should all implement in our gardens. If you have a space where you can confine it, that's even better. Another thing you can do as well is turn mint into a mint syrup. So you can start to get a little bit more creative with it. But I really want to put across that just trying to get as much enjoyment and a diversity of flavors, but thinking about drinks as well. What other herbs could you implement, perhaps even lavender, to really help you enjoy and get the most from your journey of feeding your family from your garden. The next underrated crop is wild foods, and I bet you weren't expecting that. But I think that foraging should be a core part of self-sufficiency, because you're using what the local area to you provides in terms of wild foods, for example, these rose hips, you're working with the seasons to enjoy the harvest and the flavors that made our landscapes. And so this year I can remember having an amazing blackberry harvest. I've seen some crab apples were on the way. At the top fields at Danuronen, 
we had a load of delicious parasol mushrooms. The main thing about foraging though is to understand the rules, what you should and shouldn't do, and to always make sure that you leave plenty for other beings, be it other people wanting to forage, but also for the animals. I also feel that nettles are really important wild food to enjoy, and they're so abundant and they even grow in our gardens. Whether they should or shouldn't is another question. And I'm also thinking about wild garlic, of course, which you can domesticate and grow yourself. So if you, foraging is new to you, there's loads of resources out there, great YouTube channels. But really, if you can, try and find a local forager and do a day course with them because they're going to have the best knowledge. And the real thing is, is seeing foraging as a nice, fun supplement to being in the garden. Sometimes it's really important that we go beyond our garden gate and experience what other harvest we can enjoy even on a windy day like today. Now I'd absolutely love to hear your thoughts about these crops and to also add anything that you feel would be beneficial for anyone who's reading the comments down below, just to pick up and share as much as possible. Don't forget to enter the competition and if you haven't yet seen it, I made a video which is right here a couple of weeks ago showing a load of secret harvests that you can use to feed yourself that more likely than not you're already growing. And that's another thing to contribute towards being self-sufficient.